Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be back after a few years at the fluorescence microscopy course. Um, and today I'll try to give you a little bit of an overview about um, some of our most recent activities developing new technologies uh, to uh, dissect uh, cellular pathways related to uh, transcription. And so I'll start, uh, the talk is divided in four main parts. I'll start by giving you uh, a very brief introduction about the concept of screening in general and about high throughput imaging. And I'll then uh, move to uh, some of our recent developments uh, in uh, technologies to perturb uh, gene function in a systematic manner uh, using CRISPR knockout uh, reagents. I'll then uh, switch over uh, to an assay development story related to uh, an imaging-based uh, assay uh, to uh, um, visualize and quantify uh, RNA uh, using an amplified uh, RNA uh, fluorescence in situ abridization technique. And then I'll conclude by uh, basically bringing uh, everything together and tell you a little story about a pilot screen, pilot CRISPR screen that we run to study uh, factors, epigenetic factors, regulating interferon-stimulated genes or ISGs uh, expression uh, in uh, cells. So uh, the problem here is to how to study uh, gene function. And so from a very broad uh, perspective uh, to study gene function, we need uh, to have an experimental perturbation. Uh, and in general, with functional genomics, uh, these fall into one of these three categories. So we can knock out a gene, so completely ablate it. Uh, we can induce the expression uh, of uh, a gene, so um, uh, increase its expression level uh, in the cell of its product, not of the gene per se, or uh, we can uh, inhibit uh, its expressions. And uh, all over uh, the talk today, I'll be talking about uh, protein coding genes. So uh, genes that express uh, um, a protein factor that has an, um, um, uh, a function uh, in the cell. I won't be talking about non-coding uh, non-coding genes or long non-coding RNAs. We then need to have a, bio a biological process or a phenotype uh, of interest uh, or an assay uh, to measure the effect of this perturbation. And the output of this biological process needs to result into a measurable uh, readout of some sort. Uh, that we can quantify and use as a yardstick uh, to, um, um, to measure uh, the effect of this perturbation on the system. And the readout, in very broad terms, uh, doesn't need to be imaging-based, uh, can also be a molecular, can be uh, uh, also biochemical. Today it's going to be about imaging-based readouts for the most part. And so having uh, these uh, three things, uh, now the challenge, uh, since we want to do uh, functional genomic screens, is to uh, basically test gene function, not just one gene at a time, uh, but to do it on uh, a large scale. And so uh, one of the most recent uh, uh, gene annotations uh, models, the gene code models, predicts that there's about uh, a little bit over 19,000 uh, genes in the genome. And so we need to have um, a perturbation, an assay, and a readout that scales up to uh, tens of thousands of uh, perturbations. So uh, how do we do this? Uh, we can do this via screening. And the concept of screening is pretty simple. So if we need to test one gene, let's call it gene X1, and we wonder what its effect is on uh, the readout of interest, we perturb the function of gene one somehow, in this case, we eliminate uh, its expression, for example, or we knock out its uh, genomic DNA. And uh, we can see, for example, in this hypothetical case, that the readout doesn't change. And this tells us that X1 is not involved in the biological process of interest. And we can, can repeat and do it this uh, separately. And so we can knock out gene 2. We can see, just as a pure parallel example, that uh, the readout values increase, increases we can say that uh, gene X2 is an inhibitor of this process. We do it for gene 3, we see that the readout uh, decreases. Uh, again, as an example, we can determine that gene X3 is an activator. And so on and so forth for thousands of genes, so n genes. Now, and this is again where the problem uh, arises. 
um, in Gina, Gina it's not as well, where in high throughput screening, the N tends to be very large. And so we can just do a Western blot or just an immunofluorescence uh, using um, um, a manual uh, fluorescence microscope because the number of perturbations and that, that we need to um, uh, apply and, and measure uh, ranges between hundreds to tens of thousands. Uh, I'll just mention briefly uh, two uh, fairly different ways to, to screen. I won't talk about uh, pooled screening today, but it'll be, it would be uh, borderline criminal, uh, not to mention uh, pooled functional genomic screens these days, uh, because the vast majority of functional genomic screens using CRISPR in particular these days, it's run in a pool format. Uh, so in a pool format, what we do is that uh, we, produ we produce a library containing um, 20 to 100,000 uh, different uh, CRISPR treatments in a lengthy viral vector in a single uh, gigantic viral uh, prep. We transduce the, cel the cells of interest at low MOI so that a single cell gets, um, on average, uh, one or fewer uh, lengthy viral uh, vectors integrated in the genomes. Uh, we uh, select uh, these lentivara vectors with a selection marker uh, so that we eliminate cells that are not transduced. And then we end up with a heterogeneous uh, pooled cell library that contains all the perturbations in uh, the library in a single gigantic uh, pot. And now the, the question is how to measure the effect of these perturbations on the cells uh, using a technology that allows us to deconvolute the, the, the pool of uh, perturbations. And, this is mostly uh, done through uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, but uh, these days, uh, I just want to mention that there's uh, new approaches to do this with also visual phenotypic readouts that are based on, on imaging. But I won't talk about this today. Today, I'm going to talk about ARID screening, which has been around for, um, I'd say, longer. Uh, and in ARID screening, uh, we work uh, with multi well plates. Uh, and it's called array because these multi-well plates are basically arrays of uh, wells. We grow, just zooming in on a few of uh, these wells. Um, cells are uh, grown in uh, these uh, wells that are physically separate. And each well gets one and only one perturbation. And so by um, uh, measuring uh, things, in this well, we know that these cells have gotten only that uh, perturbation, uh, these cells got another perturbation, and so on and so forth. So cells are separate, uh, the readouts uh, are uh, separate. And so we know that this well uh, received this uh, treatment, and uh, this is the results of the uh, readout measurement. Full screens are, um, let's say, easier to run because there is only one uh, gigantic plot. There more difficult to read, especially with uh, imaging readouts. RN screens are much, much easier uh, to um, uh, image and uh, to uh, analyze, but the drawback uh, is that uh, there's a lot of uh, more work upstream uh, to seed the cells and treat the cells in separate wells. So there's no free lunch as usual. Now, as far as high throughput imaging or HTI is concerned, the idea about uh, high throughput imaging is that um, in, in a traditional fluorescence microscopy uh, workflow, uh, we have an imaging-based uh, cellular assay that we can uh, measure uh, with a microscope. Uh, we have an experimental perturbation. Again, can be a single guide RNA for CRISPR screens, um, an sRNA for RNAi or a compound. And we have, oops, and we have a phenotypic uh, readout uh, that we can measure uh, by measuring cellular properties in the image. And based on the phenotypic readout, we can infer uh, the function or functions of the experimental perturbation in, in question. What high throughput imaging uh, brings to the table is the use of automation at all steps of this process. Started uh, with automated uh, liquid handling uh, to dispense experimental perturbations in uh, these wells for thousands to up to hundreds of thousands of uh, um, reagents uh, per uh, screen Continuing with high throughput microscopy with the use of uh, high throughput microscopes that I'll show you in a little bit uh, to acquire uh, uh, from tens of thousands to millions uh, of images in a completely automated uh, manner to the use of high content image analysis to automatically analyze these millions of images uh, to 
um, a segment and produce uh, single cell data for millions of cells per screen, and most importantly, to measure uh, not one, not few uh, cellular properties uh, on a per cell basis, but up to uh, tens to uh, thousands of cell of, of cell ten of thousands of cellular properties that can be used uh, with um, also with machine learning uh, approaches uh, to quantify uh, complex uh, cellular phenotypes. This is just one example of a high throughput uh, microscope. Uh, behind me, there is another one. Um, what, what we have in the facility are uh, NIP, NIPCO spinning disk uh, confocal microscopes. They're multi-channel instruments. Um, they have a variety of lenses for different ranges of applications. Uh, what's most important is that uh, high throughput microscopes in general have a completely automated X, Y, and Z stage uh, for complete, completely automated operation of the microscope uh, during uh, acquisition and an autofocus uh, laser or an autofocus LED system uh, to uh, change focus position by position. And then there's uh, one or more cameras uh, generally and uh, these instruments, again, are high throughput because they can produce terabytes of data on a per day basis and um, up to a few hundred thousands of uh, images on a per 24-hour uh, uh, period. Uh, also, very importantly, uh, uh, quite a few of these instruments have also have uh, live cell uh, imaging capabilities uh, for uh, time automated time-lapse multi-position uh, um, experiments, and I won't talk about this today. So the idea about high throughput image acquisition and analysis is that uh, we start with a plate, as I uh, showed you earlier. The microscope can be programmed to completely to um, uh, automatically acquire images at predetermined but random uh, positions in the plate, uh, where we uh, acquire uh, images in multiple channels. This is fluorescence microscopy, uh, after all, in multiple. Z planes uh, in the image and at multiple uh, time points if necessary. And as indicated earlier, uh, these instruments can produce uh, up to a few hundred thousands of uh, images per day and millions of images on a per screen or a per experiment basis. Since we're producing millions or hundreds, you know, tens of thousands to millions of images, it would be impractical or just impossible to look at these images and start measuring properties uh, manually. Not only would it be practically too impossible, it would also be biased. So we want to analyze these images in a completely automated and a completely unbiased fashion. And to do so, uh, we use a content imaging software. And in a content imaging, in a typical high content imaging analysis workflow, I'd say, at least in my experience, 99% um, of the cases, the analysis starts with an image of DAPI, which stains uh, DNA, that is used to uh, segment cells, again, in a completely automated manner. The software finds the nuclei, uh, uh, it gives a label and a unique label to the nuclei. Then based on the presence of other fluorescence uh, markers, fluorescence stains, uh, we can segment uh, other uh, cellular compartments, such as the cytoplasm or spots or any other cellular compartments that can be labeled with a fluorescent uh, label. And then we can produce uh, tables of um, millions of cells where each uh, row is a different cell and each column is a different cellular property that can be measured. What properties can we measure with high content image analysis? Uh, these fall in, say, six major classes. These are counts. How many cells do we have in the plate? How many nuclei do we have in the plate? How many spots do we have on a per cell basis? How many vesicles? Uh, how many micronuclei, and so on and so forth. Oops, I'm going haywire with a pointer. Um, we can measure um, position distances at a single object level. For example, uh, distances uh, between two spots in two different colors uh, in the same cells on a per cell basis for millions of spots per experiment, or the position of spots, for example, to other uh, cellular compartments such as the, uh, nuclear, um, the nuclear periphery. We can measure uh, differences in intensities. And here, I'm just, I, I, I indicated a negative and a positive control. So um, we are always looking at differences. This is really, really important here content imaging. Sometimes this is overlooked or not clear. These are not absolute measurements. These are always relative measurements between a negative control and a positive control. And 
you know, millions of, of test conditions, of course. So we can measure differences in uh, fluorescence intensities, differences in fluorescence, in fluorescence texture uh, inside the cell, and so differences not in absolute intensity of the fluorescence, but how the fluorescence is, uh, the, the fluorescence signal is distributed uh, inside the cells, if there's patterns. Um, differences in uh, cell morphology and size, so how big or small cells are, how elongated they are, and so on and so forth. And then relational properties, uh, either inside, uh, inside in, in sub subcellular uh, compartments, such as the clustering of nuclei inside uh, single cells, as in Cicci, or uh, the clustering of different cells in, in colonies. And so we have these clustering properties. In terms of uh, what we can uh, analyze in terms of um, uh, fluorescence stains, it's possible to work uh, with DNA fish uh, technique to um, uh, visualize uh, genomic uh, loci at a single cell level. Uh, we can use uh, um, in, uh, cell lines expressing uh, fluorescent uh, proteins uh, for the markers of choice to visualize, again, position, fluorescence intensity levels, and so on and so forth. We can use fluorescent dyes, and again, the most uh, trivial example of this is DNA um, is, is DAPI uh, to stay uh, DNA. And finally, we can also perform immunofluorescence in, a, in an automated manner uh, to measure the expression and localization of endogenous proteins in, in cells. Altogether, at least at, at high diff, we use high throughput imaging in, in two um, slightly different formats, uh, what we call deep imaging that is not really related to screening. Uh, and, and in this case, with deep imaging, we use the power of automated image acquisition and analysis to test few uh, experimental conditions in, in, in depth, where we acquire tens of thousands of images or we acquire time lapse movies. Uh, and this gives us um, unbiased information about uh, extremely rare biological events, for example, or events that are dynamic over time. And we also use hydromode imaging in a more standard fashion uh, in uh, functional, focused functional uh, genomic screens, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So to summarize this first part, um, functional genomic screens can be used to study gene function on a large scale in a systematic and unbiased uh, fashion. And high throughput imaging can be used a versatile readout technology to measure phenotypes. And when I say phenotypes, it's things that we can see under, under the microscope uh, in the images, but on a, large, on a large scale. Now, moving on to the second part, uh, a little about functional genomic screening uh, reagents. So I told you uh, that we work mostly with RA uh, screens. Uh, and the idea, again, with, uh, behind our screens is to knock down or knock out one gene at a time and then measure a phenotype with microscopy. Historically speaking, we at HITIF and, and, and other, uh, other cores have used RNAi as a technology to knock down uh, protein expression. And RNAi has been around uh, you know, for about 15 years now. Uh, and we are, we are still using this. Um, and the idea behind uh, RNAi screens uh, is that we have uh, synthetic RNA oligos that it's, a com it's commercially produced. We can spot it at the bottom of 304 well plates uh, using automated liquid handling. We can reverse transfect cells with a transfection reagent. The uh, um, RNA, uh, siRNA oligos get into the cells. Um, they knock down uh, protein expression and then uh, we incubate for 72 hours to wait for the, the knockdown uh, to take effect fix and then stain with a stain of, uh, of choice and then, and then image. The problem with RNAi uh, is that RNAi as a technology has a substantial of target uh, effects and a partial, uh, partial penetrance. And so for this reason, uh, we and others have uh, decided to um, uh, try and transition from RNAi uh, to another uh, technology to um, um, perturb gene expression, uh, which is based on the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system uh, to knock out, so to completely eliminate uh, gene expression in, uh, in target cells. And the system works in this way. So we have our gene, uh, uh, our gene of, um, of choice uh, coding for protein factor X. It has a start, um, and this is genomic uh, DNA. 
uh, there is uh, the gene uh, in the gene there's a start the, the starting position for the uh, CDS uh, and then of course we have introns and we have exons uh, with CRISPR knockout, uh, what we do is that um, uh, single guide RNAs uh, are designed, and these are also commercial products, and they're synthesized. Uh, again, these are synthetic uh, products, and the single guide RNAs can program the Cas9 uh, endonuclease to bind and specifically uh, introduce double strand uh, breaks at specific regions of the genome. And in this particular case, what we do is that uh, we have three different single guide RNAs that have different uh, sequence specificity for the same gene in the same exon in a 50 to 100 base pair windows. The result of this is that, uh, thanks to, and I, I'm not showing Cas9 and the single guide RNAs here, is that uh, we have the um, Cas9 ribonucleoprotein, the program Cas9, Cas DNA here uh, in and th there might be different cuts in different cells, but overall we have three cutting sites. The cutting sites are uh, repaired by the DNA damage repair machinery. And the DNA damage repair machinery, there are several mechanisms, we're not going to get into details, but these, the, uh, th these cuts are repaired in an imprecise fashion. Uh, fashion. And so we have both introduction of um, uh, insertions and micro deletions or indels. These uh, indels um, create uh, small deletions that can per se have a, a function on, 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 uh, on the function of the, of the, of the protein, uh, but they can also include uh, frame shifts. And when a protein goes into frame shifts, the mRNA will express a bunch of uh, stop codons that were not there in the original wild type uh, gene. And these stop codons are either uh, sensed uh, by the mRNA uh, nonsense mediated uh, decay mechanism in the cells that lead to the degradation of the mRNA, or if these mRNAs are translated, uh, they lead to truncations that can be extensive, or and or uh, to uh, protein quality control mediated degradation. All these mechanisms result into ablation of protein function and the same, uh, in, in cells that carry on this, uh, these edits. So this was our first attempt at using uh, single guide RNAs in a high throughput fashion. Uh, we used uh, cell lines that are expressing Cas9, uh, stably expressing Cas9, and we transfected uh, these single guide RNAs, a control, uh, not, not, not cutting anywhere, and a single guide uh, pool uh, of RNAs against the lamina gene. We produce a lamina, which is an essential component of the nuclear envelope, as you can see here. And this is 72 hours post transfection And here the idea is that we stay in these cells. I have DAPI in magenta and uh, um, an antibody and IF against the lamina gene, uh, which of course is expressed in all cells at pretty stable uh, levels. When we knock out lamina expression, uh, lamina is knocked out in more than 80-90% of the cells, which is what we want. Since we're using high content imaging, uh, we can all and high content image analysis, we can also quantify this at the single cell level and also at the at the well level. I'm not going to go through all this data, but the idea here uh, is that we can knock out a lamina expression. We have um, lamina intensity on the y-axis at several different at a fairly low concentration of the transfection reagent and at very uh, low concentrations of the single guide RNA itself. So this is seems to be fairly uh, efficient. Uh, we also wanted to start uh, testing whether by knocking out a gene we can actually not just measure the level of the protein that is knocked out, uh, which was you know kind of a good first control, but also to check whether uh, we can see phenotypes uh, and to look for a simple silly phenotype that was easy to quantify. Uh, we decided to knock out uh, the uh, PCNA uh, uh, DNA replication uh, clamp loader. Uh, and this was known, this is a factor, it's known that when it's knocked down or knocked out, uh, cells, I think they arrest in S phase. Anyway, it's known that the nuclei get, get larger. Uh, and what you see here is this is exactly what we observed in our condition, uh, indicating that by knocking out a gene, we can actually now measure a phenotype. And again, uh, this is the quantification um, just to measure, quantify these, these effects. 
So to summarize the second part, uh, CRISPR knockout or KO can be achieved with reverse transfection of synthetic guide RNAs and 304 well imaging plates. The knockout is extremely efficient. We can measure uh, phenotypes. And as a corollary to, cor corollary to this, um, we uh, and others uh, need stable cell lines that are expressing Cas9. Uh, and this is an approach that uh, works in different cell lines uh, that we tested and I'm not showing you here uh, today. Now, moving to the third part, talking about uh, an assay uh, to uh, measure a biological process. Uh, we and others have uh, used the throughput imaging, as indicated before, uh, to visualize DNA, to visualize uh, proteins, but at least in our hands and in other hands as well, uh, not much was known about uh, assays to measure RNA in a high throughput manner, with the exception of a few uh, papers uh, from the Peltman uh, lab uh, from a few years ago. So why would we want to visualize mRNA in a high throughput fashion? The first um, and simplest uh, target are mature mRNAs to measure uh, gene expression, and this is what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, but we can also uh, um, visualize and measure nascent mRNA to measure active uh, transcription, uh, to visualize and answer RNAs, uh, which are important uh, for, uh, again, regulation of gene expression, or visualize alternative uh, exons uh, to uh, look at alternative splicing, and then, of course, long non coding RNAs that are involved in a variety of, um, of uh, nuclear-related processes. And in terms of desirable properties of a potential technique uh, to measure, to visualize measure RNA in a high throughput manner, uh, we wanted to work in a 304 well plate. Uh, we wanted to work with, uh, not with a 100x foil objective, which is what it's usually used for a single molecule uh, fish. Uh, we wanted to have a limited number of staining steps, which makes it compatible uh, with automated uh, liquid handling. Uh, we wanted to work with short RNA targets, again, to work with an answer RNAs, alternative reactions, and non coding RNAs. We wanted to be multiplexable, ideally three, but potentially more. Our microscope only has four channels and one is for DAPI, so at least three. We wanted to be robust and quantifiable, and also we wanted not to break the back. Um, so this is fairly important when, when you know, sort of considering um, uh, ways to optimize an assay, one need also to consider the cost of the reagents. And with all these considerations in mind, uh, our choice fell on a previously published technique to amplify uh, mRNA fish called the bridgeation chain reaction uh, that was optimized by the uh, Pierce lab at Paltech. Uh, and in a bridgeation chain reaction, we have two steps a detection stage and amplification stage. The detection stage, we have our mRNA target of choice. We can bioinformatically, it's actually not we, the company that provides these reagents bioinformatically designs pools of uh, uh, oligosynthetized DNA probes that have a sequence specificity for the target of interest, and there's multiple probe, uh, uh, probe pair sets against the same, the same genes. These uh, oligoprobes uh, carry uh, a specific initiator, split initiator sequence uh, that uh, gives sequence specificity uh, to uh, these hairpins uh, that can that are open. These are um, uh, fluorescently labeled, and these ha hairpins open uh, in the presence of this initiator sequence and start a chain reaction of polymerization of uh, these hairpins at the side of the mRNA, and so we have an amplified signal, okay? <coughs> to study, I mean, to, to implement this system, we decided to start simple, so we wanted to start with an induct in inductible, uh, in inducible system, and we decided uh, to use the interferon uh, gamma uh, signaling uh, pathway, which uh, it's very important in biology, uh, and also it's fairly well characterized in terms of the upstream components of the signaling pathway. And it's also known uh, to uh, activate a battery of about 300 genes uh, that are named um, interferon-stimulated genes, or uh, ISGs, which are, have a variety of uh, functions uh, related uh, to uh, viral uh, defense and other cellular functions. For today's 
talk, it's not really important what these ISGs do. Uh, we just want to uh, use them as a proxy uh, for the activity of the interferon gamma receptor pathway and to, to see whether we can use HCR to measure uh, gene expression. And so we went into a very old set of microRNA data, uh, like it's 1999, uh, and previously published. And uh, we decided to focus our attention on the IF3 gene. Again, not really important what IF3 does. We chose IF3 just because we observed uh, from uh, this data set it was in use between um, uh, 30 to 40 times in uh, human fibroblasts. And so it gave us a good window uh, to measure uh, gene expression. So these are our results of our first results of measuring IFE3 expression in cells that were either not treated with interferon gamma. So this represents the basal levels of expression of IFE3 in cells in green. We also have a housekeeping gene, HPRT1, which is uh, predicted not to change, uh, whose, uh, whose expression levels are predicted not to change. And so you see, well, you kind of see here uh, these dots. These represent mRNA molecules in the cells. There's quite a few magenta spots, uh, HPRT1, few to no uh, um, green spots, uh, which represent FE3 when we, have, uh, we, when we don't have interferon gamma. When we add interferon gamma and then wait and then fix cells at uh, um, subsequent times, we have not much happening after 15 minutes. At 30 minutes, we get some cells that are starting expressing. 60 minutes now, all cells express uh, mRNA. 120 minutes now, cells are blasting expression. And at 240, uh, it's a Christmas tree. So it's completely uh, light up and all cells express. Also, interestingly, uh, these probes are against mature mRNA, so they should just be in the cytoplasm. Uh, we think that uh, we also see these uh, large uh, foci, fluorescent foci inside the nucleus, generally one or two, and uh, these might actually represent nascent mRNA in sites of active transcription in the cells, but we are not quantifying those. We are quantifying uh, these spots in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, which represent, likely represent mature mRNA. Just in terms of analysis, this is fairly simple. It's one of the easiest uh, high quantity image analysis pipelines that we have. We find the nuclei using the DAPI. We find the cytoplasm using the background of signal of DAPI uh, in the cytoplasm. And then uh, we use spot detection algorithms uh, to find the spots and then to count them. And so we, as a proxy of gene expression, we're basically saying how many spots do we have on, in a cell? There's more spots, there's more expression, fewer, fewer spots, low expression. These are, uh, this is single cell data at uh, different uh, time points indicated here in different colors and at different doses of uh, interferon gamma. As you can see here, we have for IV3, we have uh, low to no expression at time point zero, increasing uh, expression, the, the entire distribution shifts to the right uh, at, at uh, later time points. HPRT1 does not change. Uh, this is not just true at the single cell level. Now, if we summarize things uh, at, on a per well level, which is usually what we use for screens, uh, we also see a nice uh, induction that it's not only uh, time dependent, but it's also dose dependent. And again, for HPRT1, there's no change. So to summarize this third part, uh, HCR and a fish can be simultaneously simultaneously used to uh, visualize up to three mRNA targets. I showed you two today, but we, we tested it up to three and it works. Uh, it provides information both at the single cell level and at the well level. Uh, it is compatible uh, with liquid automation. This is just on one line on this slide. It took us a year and a half to, to, to optimize it. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk to you about this today. Uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about ISGs and mature mRNAs, but we already used it in collaboration uh, with other researchers at NIH uh, to quantify alternative uh, splicing and to quantify uh, gene expression uh, responses to um, immuno, um, um, immuno stimulants and immunosuppressors in, in primary uh, human purified blood cells. And these are uh, the citations if you wanna go and check. Now, to bring everything together, uh, we have a technique to knock out gene expression 
uh, in, a, in a high throughput manner. We have a way to measure uh, gene expression of ISGs in response to interferon gamma. Um, the question is now, can we use CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, screen uh, for epigenetic factors that are regulating the expressions of ISGs in the cells expressing Cas9? And this is fairly important because the signaling, the upstream signaling pathway is very well characterized and is a pretty linear pathway, but much less is known about um, uh, factors, set of factors that regulate the expression of the chromatin uh, level. And so here I'm showing you controls uh, sgRNA controls uh, in this uh, interferon gamma and IFE3 uh, assay. To recapitulate, this is what I showed you earlier. These are different cells, but uh, the idea here is that when we do not add interferon gamma, we have HPRT1 uh, and IFE3. HPRT1 is expressed, it's a housekeeping gene. IFE3 is not expressed. We add interferon gamma, we have induction of expression, we had a scramble. Uh, single guide RNA that does not cut anywhere in the genome, nothing happens. This is a single guide RNA against an olfactory receptor gene, and we hope that an olfactory receptor gene is not expressed and is not doing anything in colorectal cancer cells. Uh, but the, the DNA, the genomic DNA is still there, and so this serves as an important negative control for DNA damage responses that might have an effect uh, in our assay. And what you can see here is that by, just by cutting with, a sing, with single guide RNAs, uh, nothing seems to change for uh, IFE3. What's more important is that when we knock out two of the factors in the upstream signaling uh, pathway, uh, JAK1 and interferon gamma receptor 2, uh, that were necessary for the expression of these genes, we see almost complete abla ablation of gene expression of IFE3 in the presence of interferon gamma indicating uh, that uh, we can knock out uh, gene expression and look at interferon-stimulated gene uh, expression. And, uh, and so these are basically our, our positive controls. And negative and positive controls are very, very important in, in, in any screen. And again, this is the quantification at a single cell level. HPRT1 doesn't change. IFE3 one IFE3 uh, uh, expression is knocked out in uh, cells transfected with uh, single guide RNAs against JAK1 and inferon gamma receptor 2. And this is the quantification at the well level. So this is a nice uh, assay window. So with this assay in hand, um, we uh, reverse transfected oligos sgRNAs. Uh, we, uh, after 72 hours, we wait for the uh, single guide RNAs to knock out the gene and for proteins to get degraded target problems to be degraded. We then add interferon gamma. We wait four hours. We then fix and permeabilize. And then we start staining for uh, HCR. And again, this is a two-step, uh, it's a two-step process. And then uh, we use our hydropod microscope to image uh, cells and to analyze them to count spots on a per cell basis. We started to start uh, small. Uh, with a pilot screen against a library of 865 human genes uh, involved uh, in um, uh, epigenetic regulation, so factors related to chromatin or chromatin-related factors. And we always have three single guide RNAs per gene. They're pulled in the same in the same well. And we run this assay into biological replicates for uh, a total of um, almost 2,000 wells, including uh, the controls. I'm going to give away the, the lead right away. These are, this is a protein-protein a, a interaction network of the 31 hits that we found from the screens, whose knockout resulted in an increase in gene expression of uh, IV3 in the presence of interferon. And I'm showing you this uh, because uh, this, is, this is fairly striking. Uh, so we have two main protein complexes that we could retrieve from the screen. The first one is the cohesin uh, complex, which is involved in 3D genome organization, and in particular in the loop extrusion mechanism uh, that is involved in the formation of loop and topological associated domains, or TADS, and including also the CTCF factor that actually binds specific sequences in, in the genome and recruits uh, cohesin. 
We also got, and I'll, shoot, I'll tell you this later, we also got cohesion loaders in, uh, in, uh, in, as, as hits. And the other major protein complex uh, was the new A4 um, histone acetylase complex that, again, is involved in a variety of, of different um, uh, functions. But again, without knowing anything, right, um, this is not that we picked these genes to study, like I have always done. Uh, these are just coming out from the screen. So we, we were not biased towards these, these, these complexes. But this is a strong signal that indicates that these two complexes might have a function in this process. This is just to show you this graph to, to, to demonstrate the, the strength of the effect. So in, in these graphs, we have all the uh, 865 uh, different treatments ranked based on the effect on uh, IV3. So we have uh, knockout treatments that um, when, they, when, we, when we knock out uh, cells for a particular gene, uh, we get an increase in IV3 expression. And on this side, we get um, uh, genes that when knocked out, uh, we get a decrease in gene expression. So what we find here are either inhibitors of um, interferon stimulated gene expression or genes that are um, who, whose result when, when proteins are ablated are somehow a response that upregulates interference stimulated genes. So we have the entire cohesin complex plus uh, two uh, cohesin loaders on chromatin. So these have a positive effect on uh, cohesin function. We did not uh, find these uh, other genes. This is pretty interesting uh, because again, NIPBL and MAU2 are chromatin, uh, chromatin loaders. So they're positive regulators of cohesin function, uh, or at least this is what's known about these genes. SMC1, SMC3, and RAD21 are um, essential components of the cohesin complex. We could only find uh, one of the two PDS5 genes in our screen. There's a PDS5 and a PDS5B. We could not find STAG1 stag, stag and STAG2, and we could not uh, find WACL, uh, which is the chromatin unloader. So this is actually a negative regulator of cohesin function. This is pretty interesting because uh, this might actually indicate that these knockout screens actually tell you not just what protein complexes are involved in a certain cellular process, but they might actually tell you a little bit about compensatory functions of different proteins in the complex. And these two genes are parallel, so by knocking down one, the other one might actually pick up the slack and, and compensate for that function. Uh, importantly, uh, we also have a housekeeping gene. So when we knock out uh, the, the cohesin uh, complex genes, we get an upregulation of IV3. So these pulse move to the right, uh, but they don't, not, they don't move up. If anything, uh, knockout of RAD21 actually causes a severe downregulation of, H of the HPRT1 uh, gene, indicating that this upregulation in gene expression is not a generic upregulation of all gene expression in the cell. So it's not, it's not this specific. Also importantly, with the exception of RAD21, uh, which is fairly toxic, uh, the other knockouts did not have effect on the number of cells. And what this tells us is that by knocking out these factors, it's not like we're just killing cells at 72 hours or we, cells are, are, are stopping. Different things might happen at longer time points, but at least at 72 hours, we're pretty confident that what we're seeing here is not a cytotoxic or a cytostatic effect. I mentioned uh, NUA4. This is the same plot that I showed you before with other uh, subunits uh, indicated here. Again, as for the uh, cohesin complex, we could find five, uh, six out of 11 of the previously uh, um, uh, identified subunits of this complex in, in, in human cells, indicating that uh, this uh, knockout screening is fairly um, uh, efficient in pulling out uh, gene functions uh, from uh, these screens. And in terms of other potential hits, uh, we found a bunch of other proteins. What really sort of attracted our attention was this MET12 uh, um, uh, factor. MET12 is part of um, the mediator complex. But in this case, um, we had other subunits of mediator in the library, MED1, MED25, MED24, and they did not have uh, any effect. And so we could have just discarded MED12 because it was just a one-off uh, factor. It's really, really interesting though, 
is that by digging a little bit in the literature, it turns out that uh, MET12 has actually um, um, partially non-overlapping functions with the mediator complex uh, uh, at large. And so this is MET12, which is part of the cycling kinase module. And uh, other labs had previously demonstrated that by knockout of MET12, nothing happens to a uh, mediator, but the, um, the cycling kinase module, CKM, actually uh, falls apart. I also want to uh, point your attention to the fact that MET13 stays with the rest of the complex and cycling C and CDK8 uh, actually fall apart. Interestingly, we did not have in the library, as indicated here, cycling C, CDK8, and MET13, MET and none of the other subunits of uh, Mediator. Uh, other important point, again, digging in the literature, and this is part of a screen. I, I want to show this because this is also what happens when one gets results from a screen. You need to start looking in the literature and try to make sense. The, the, the assay will not tell you what's important and, and, and what's really relevant. You need to put in your, your brain and start looking for, for things in your biological expertise of the pathways. Um, in this case, uh, this uh, paper from about uh, 10 years ago had shown that uh, knocking uh, down mediator in mouse ES cells had a similar effect as knocking down cohesins. And again, cohesins is one of the factors that we found in our, in our screen, indicating potential functional similarities uh, between these two. In this case, again, what's interesting here that by knocking down SMC1, they get physical separations of genomic loci that are part of the same TAD, uh, indicating that MET12 might actually have a role in the regulation of 3D genome architecture, uh, which would make sense based on the results we get on cohesin uh, knockouts. Uh, more recent uh, experiments with a technique that is called uh, IC, that is not imaging based, it's next generation sequencing based, it's used again to measure 3D genome conformation on a genome wide scale, indicated uh, that uh, knockouts of uh, this factor, SSC4, which is MAL2, which we also found uh, in our screen, can actually compensate for the uh, knockout of uh, WAPL. So when WAPL is knocked out, we have a stronger formation of these loop domains. When we knock out MAL2, uh, these domains disappear. When we knock out, knocked out both, both uh, factors, uh, things go back to normal, indicating functional compensation. Uh, this is again not not our data. This is uh, other data in the literature. And what's very interesting, more recent data from the same lab also indicated the knockout of MET12 has a similar effect as uh, the cohesin loader, and can uh, uh, partially compensate for the knockout of WAPO, indicating that again what we might be looking at here might be a 3D genome conformation uh, effect that might actually have an, an effect on the expression of ISGs. Before going into uh, any extensive uh, uh, molecular mechanism though, like in any other screen, we decided to validate these hits. So we reorder all the single guide RNAs that were hits in the, in the library, plus other guides that were not present in, in, in the library for um, a few key protein complexes. Uh, I'll briefly go through. Uh, we, uh, again, retrieved NIBL, SMC3. They had an effect on IFE3. Uh, the other subunits that are not had an effect on our screen did not did not have an effect in the validation. Mediator, MET12, again, very strong. Uh, we could also, these two factors were not in the original library. Uh, we get a similar effect indicating that cycling kinase module might actually be at play here. Other mediator factors, again, validated as being not relevant uh, for uh, this uh, process. Uh, several subunits of the new A4 complex uh, validated, uh, whereas subunits that were not hits in the screen also did not validate. So we are reproducing the data. And again, we could also find beta catenine. I'm going to skip this. Now, we tested only one gene at the beginning. So the effects that we might have seen were only on, on IV3. This has nothing to do with ISGs in general. So we tested another interferon regulated gene, IV1. We saw similar effects uh, with knockdown of NIBL, again, cohesin loader, MET12, uh, and several components of the new A4 complex. This is another gene, IFI2. So now we have three genes that are regulated, so it's likely not just a one gene uh, effect. But most importantly, uh, when we tested 
uh, other uh, genes with a completely independent technique, uh, QRT-PCR, to measure gene expression, what we saw is that uh, knockdown of NIBL, MED12, and TRAP1 not only strongly activated gene expression in the presence of uh, interferon, uh, and here we have th uh, a battery of five interferon stimulated genes, IFE3, IFE1, IFE2, DDX58, and IFEH, but also, and kind of unexpectedly, uh, activated expression of interferon stimulated genes in the absence of uh, interferon. And I think there's two main key points here. Uh, the first one uh, is that, again, we are getting these effect in the absence of uh, interferon, indicating that knockdown of uh, cohesin and NUA4 and MET12 might actually be sufficient by itself to activate interferon stimulated uh, gene expression, not at the level of interferon stimulation per se. And the second one is that, again, it's really, really important when you're validating uh, genes from a functional genomic screens to use a completely independent technique to make sure that what you're seeing are not technical artifacts. And finally, uh, with a completely different uh, technology uh, to knock down uh, uh, protein expression, uh, I'm not going to go into detail here, this is chemically induced uh, acute degradation of RAD21, and by looking at gene expression genome-wide, uh, we could see that a battery of interferon stimulated genes are expressed in cells where RAD21 is degraded uh, in the absence of interferon gamma stimulation. Again, strengthening the idea that by messing around with cohesin function, uh, we are getting an interferon simulated gene response. And now the fun part comes. So we validated this, uh, this uh, effect. So we know that when we knock out uh, these genes, we see something here. This we know. Uh, now the whole, whatever it's in between, it's up for uh, investigation. And we're working on this. But this is usually actually the, 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 the part where our collaborators spend the most time which is finding out what the molecular mechanism is to link the original observation that are coming out from the screen all the way uh, to uh, the actual molecular story. In this particular case, I can tell you that we already looked at DNA damage. We don't think that DNA damage is involved in this process. We looked at mitotic defects. We do not think that mitotic defects are involved. We know that when cohesin subunits are uh, knocked out, and also MET12 subunits are knocked out. There's a loss of chromatin loops. There's also alterations to um, a constitutive uh, heterochromatin, and that somehow uh, these alterations might lead to um, the presence of some sort of molecular signal that is sensed uh, by uh, other factors uh, in the cells unknown at this point and that uh, these uh, sensing, um, uh, the disactivation of these sensors might actually lead uh, through pathways that are still unknown, at least to us, to the activation of interferon stimulated genes. And so this is what's going to be our next step. So, summarize this last part. Uh, we, I, I showed you um, an application of R8 functional genomics uh, using CRISPR uh, uh, knockout to uh, applied to an assay where we visualized and quantified our expression in a high throughput imaging. Uh, we used this uh, in a pilot screen to identify epigenetic regulators of the ISG signatures, and the, the results of the knock of, of, of the screen that we validated indicate that cohesin, cohesin loaders, cycling canis modules, and OA4 knockouts uh, lead to activation of the ISG signature, and we're now working on. Uh, the uh, molecular mechanism. And now for the acknowledgments, uh, this work was done by a single person, uh, Laurent Osborne, laboratory biologist in, uh, in the lab, with help with, uh, from a former um, uh, postback student uh, in, uh, in the lab a few years ago that worked on the optimization of uh, HCR in a high throughput format. And then of course I showed you um, the RNA-seq data um, in RAD21 degron cells from some of our collaborators that are part of uh, our same uh, branch. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take questions. <laughs>